Dad, I got yours. I feel privileged today uh, on so many different levels. Um, one is because I get to I get to stand in this pulpit, man. Y'all get to hear some great preaching every single Sunday morning. Amen. Yeah. Y'all could have done a little bit better job on a Sunday morning. Amen. I'm trying to get y'all to pump your pastor up now. Come on. But y'all get to hear some dynamic communication, and uh, and then the other thing is he let me wear his new headphone set here. I mean, matter of fact, when I put it on, several of the people go, "Oh, he let you wear it." I was like, "I said that's because our heads are the same size, so you know it's all it's all good." But um, I I, I do want to say uh, on behalf of uh, our campus in St. Francisville, thank you for allowing me to uh, come this morning and and be able to share just a little. A word with you guys. Uh, I have this morning our associate pastors, Pastor uh, Mike and Lynn McCain. Uh, our focus this week is on missions. We're doing a big missions push uh, to get ready for the summertime and all the missions trips that we have. And they were uh, missionaries to the Ukraine and Uganda and uh, Austria and uh, all that area for about five years. So um, I talked with them this morning. They said, we prayed this morning. We prayed on the way in. I said, y'all better pray. I'm, I'm going to need everything I can get. Come on. But uh, I, I am truly honored to be here on this Sunday morning. For those of you, uh, my name is Timmy Strait, and I'm a campus pastor, one of the campus pastors for Healing Place Church, and we are in St. Francisville. I'm up in the woods. Come on. Uh, we, we got, we, we've got, y'all have got more red lights on one street than we got in our entire parish. So, it really and truthfully, I mean, if you blink when you go through St. Francisville, you have missed it. But uh, we love it. I tell everybody, you know, somebody asked me, how big is St. Francisville? Well, there are 13,500 people in the parish. 7,000 of those are on Angola State Penitentiary. <laughs> <laughs> kind of give you a little perspective. They ain't coming to church. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but, uh, but we go to them. We actually do a service at Angola. Been in there for nine years. And, um, and God has blessed us we, uh, to go in there. I'm, I'm convinced uh, that we have men in, in our penal systems and women in our penal systems that are more free than people in our actually church. And I mean that. I, I mean that because those men, man, when we get in there and, and worship, uh, they're louder than the music. Uh, sometimes it's difficult for the worship leaders to keep up with it because the men are, are, are worshiping God so loud. And so uh, we're just very honored and humbled to be able to be out there and, and do what God's doing. Uh, we've been out there for the, we're in our 12th year in St. Francis, Phil. Uh, I never wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to be a youth director, a youth pastor, because uh, I was a youth pastor growing up, and that was my heartbeat. Uh, but how many of you know that if you want to make God laugh, you just tell him your plans? And uh, so he's chuckled at me several times, but... Uh, so now what I do is I just tell everybody I'm, I'm still a youth pastor at heart. I just got to preach that way to, to the adults. And so, uh, but it's good. Amen. Look at the person next to you. Say, I can need some pepping up today. Come on. It's all right. It's all good. I love your pastor. I've gotten a chance to know uh, Pastor Marvin over the last couple of years uh, through our, our relationship there at Healing Place Church and everything. And uh, he is such a tremendous man of God, and I respect him so much. He and his wife, they're doing an incredible job here. You're blessed to have him as your pastor, no doubt. And, uh, and, and he's always so considerate. You know, um, a few weeks ago, I, I was not uh, able to attend a missions trip that he was wanting me to go with him to Mexico um, to, uh, you know, to go minister to the animals. And, um, and he was trying to pierce their heart, but in a different way. But uh, he wanted me to go. I couldn't go. And, man, he was because I had, you know, I had a school board meeting and I, I had my daughter's basketball games. And I really wanted to go. And so he was so considerate to, to send me pictures of uh, while he was on the stand and all of the, the beautiful scenery and big bucks that were coming out all over the place because I love the deer hunt. And, uh, and so uh, I, I just finally texted him. I said, please quit. Please stop. Just, <laughs> just, just stop. Just, it's not fun. But, uh, but I do. I, I appreciate him so much, and I'm hoping that he and I get to go do some kayak fishing. I love to do some kayak fishing, and, uh, but it's, it's, uh, I love the outdoors. I, am definitely, I definitely have my father's blood in me. Uh, my, my, I, wrote, I had a, a license plate I gave my dad one time. It says, I breathe, therefore I hunt, and uh, that was my dad. And so, uh, but I, I, I want to share some, some. I know you all are in a series uh, this week called uh, God is Good. Is that correct? And I know that y'all also had something go on yesterday where we talked about serving and, and reaching out and, and everything. So I want to kind of combine some stuff today. And uh, if you don't mind, get your Bibles out. I want you to turn to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 9. I say Bibles, 
uh, notepads, uh, Android devices, iPhones, <laughs> iPads. Now when you say Bible, people automatically start pulling out their, their iPads or their iPhones, and that's how they kind of read uh, read the Bible now. I don't, very very rarely do you have, uh, I think the older generation still owns an actual Bible. Uh, a lot of the younger generation, I like the fact that you're able to pull up any translation you want to on the U version and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so hopefully you're going to be taking notes because it is a proven fact that 85% of the people that take notes make it to heaven. <laughs> That's not true. I made that up. And, uh, but anyway, <laughs> I just like people taking notes. So Because uh, if you're like me, you're going to forget everything as soon as you walk out the door this morning, right? Because when you walk out the door, you're not going to be thinking about the message. You're going to be thinking about where we eating lunch again. Come on. I know that feeling. I, I was born and raised in church. I tell people that, grow, that I had a drug problem growing up. Because uh, my mom drug me to Sunday school, she drug me to WMU meetings, she drug me to youth ministry. So, but anyway, hey, let me pray, and then uh, I want I want to share a word with you this morning. Father, thank you so much for um, God, just for for uh, your love that you have for us, God, that you, you care so much about us, uh, that God, you sent your one and only Son to find us in the condition that we were in. Your Word tells us that in while we were yet sinners. Not when we were perfect, not when everything was going great in our life, not when we were acting right, not when we were sold out to you. And while we were yet sinners, your son died for us. May we never, never forget the price that he paid for our lives. May every day that we wake up and we talked about and we sang about the breath in our lungs Father, you gave us this breath. Right now, you're giving us this breath. And with everything inside of us, we want to give it back to you in the way that we worship, in the words that we speak, in the way we live our lives. So, Jesus, today we ask you to have your way. Holy Spirit, we give you free reign over this place. This is not my service. This is not Souls Harbor service. This is your service. So we yield it to you today. You move in any way you see fit. You speak in any way you want to speak. We yield ourselves to you. Father, we love you. We honor you in Christ's precious name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I want to I I give you two words, if you're writing the notes down, two words that if you will allow it to, and, I, and I'm going to pull my glasses on and off. I try not to wear them because I don't like them, but I, I can't read if I don't have them on. And so anybody else feel me on that one? Okay. Uh, it's really gone bad over the last couple of years. But anyway, two words that if you will, that when spoken to you, and I believe there are two words that Jesus himself through the Holy Spirit speaks to every individual that ever steps foot on this planet. But there are two words that they will either radically transform your life for the good or they will radically transform your life for the bad. And let me explain what I mean by that. Here's the two words. If you're taking notes, here's the two words. You can write them down. The two words are, follow me. Follow me. Think about that for just one second. Follow me. Jesus gives every individual in this room, the word says that, he, that none should perish, but that all should come into repentance, that all should come to Christ. Is that not right? That he wants everybody, that, that, that God is no respecter of person, that what he's done for one, he'll do. Listen, just because these musicians are up here and they're flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit doesn't make, make them any bigger in God's eyes than you. The same grace and the same mercy that God showed to each and every one of those, the, the same testimony that you hear other individuals talking about how God radically transformed their lives and God moved into their hearts, it's the same God that wants to do the same thing in each and every one of your lives. And he wants to do it in your family's life. And he wants to do it in your neighbor's life. And that guy that aggravates you on the job, he wants to do it in his life. And that woman across the street that gossips all the time, he wants to do the same thing in her life. Are you hearing me? Follow me. He gives everybody that option. He gives everybody that opportunity to follow him. He speaks that at some point in time. For some of us, I think about when, when Pastor was walking me through a while ago and in the sex service, so second service, they'll have the, the children's church. And for some of us, it happened when we were in children's church. Some of you in here, you've been in church your entire life. You can remember the day that, that maybe it was during a, a children's church or a VBS or maybe a youth setting or whatever it may have been to where you, you remember when God spoke, something happened in your heart. There was a tugging. There was all of a sudden this realization of, wow, so I'm not where I need to be. I'm not right. And I need to make sure that my life is right with God. And so maybe somebody led you in a prayer. Maybe you knelt by your bed on your own. Maybe you were riding in your car and you just repented to the Lord and you asked him to come into your heart. 
For some of you, maybe it wasn't when you were young. Maybe it's just been just a few months ago, a few years ago. I'll never forget a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Ickard. Pretty cool name. You'll never forget about a name by the name of Malcolm Ickard. Brother Malcolm was 72 years old. He was retired. His entire life revolved around going down Walker South Road and running rabbit dogs after he retired. Single man, his wife had divorced and left him, and he was a single guy and, and living in a trailer up in the hood. And uh, for, a, for an older white guy living right, literally right up in the middle of the hood, that was just kind of unusual, but he had, that was a piece of property he had owned. And, and he went to a little church one day. Somebody invited him. And he went into that church, and God radically got a hold of his, had never accepted Christ at 72 years of age, walked down an aisle, gave his heart to the Lord, and never looked back, sold all of his dogs, and committed his life to doing nothing but sharing the gospel. And I remember going over to Brother Malcolm's house one time after I had the opportunity of meeting him, and we were sitting in there, and I was talking to him about his property and talking to him. We were talking about his dogs, and we were talking about that. And all of a sudden, I said, well, Brother Malcolm, and he had, only been, he had been saved for about two years at that time. And I said, Brother Malcolm, I said, tell me a little bit about Jesus. 72 years old, he sat there. He just began to weep. And he just said, to know what he did for me, and what he's forgiven me of. How could I ever, ever, ever repay him? I'll spend every last breath that I have giving back what he gave me. And I just thought in the back of my mind, here's a man that's 72 years old, and you would think, wow, you know, he's almost at the end of his life. And he's like, no, no, no. And I, and I remember my dad and I sitting at a restaurant one time, Bubba's Restaurant on, on, on Airline Highway in Prairieville. And I'm sitting at the back of this re restaurant eating breakfast with my dad, and Brother Malcolm walks in the door. And there's probably about eight or nine tables with people sitting at each one of them. And Brother Malcolm walks through the door, and I see him talking to the lady, and it was kind of his frequented spot. And, and all of a sudden, he looks over in my direction. He sees me, and his eyes just kind of light up a little bit. And he starts walking in my direction, and he stopped at every single one of those tables. Did not know anybody at any one of them. And he just walked up to him, and this is what he did. He says, how are y'all doing today? He said, can I introduce myself to you? He said, my name is Malcolm Ickert. And I just want to let you know that I love you so much. But more importantly, Jesus loves you. And he's got a purpose. And he did, listen, by the time he got to me, breakfast, I would have done it on my breakfast. But he made a purpose at 72 years of age to, to go to every single one. Of them. And I thought in the back of my mind, Lord, if that man can do that at 72, what can I be doing at 22? Because that's how old I was at the time. Follow me and I want, I want to talk a lot. I want to share a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 9 because there were 12 men that Jesus spoke the exact same two words to, and it radically not only radically transformed their life, but for 11 of them, they would go on to radically transform the world. Look, look at this passage of scripture. Now, I'm, I'm just gonna let you know, I don't read all the way through the scripture, I read and break down, read and break down. Is that okay? So uh, I just want to give it to you as, as I get Matthew chapter 9, starting verse 9, it says this. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now, now I want you to imagine for just one second. Here's Matthew. Matthew got up that morning. It was just another day. There was nothing, nothing different in his world about that day. It was just another day, another typical day. In the life of Matthew, the tax collector. Here's what you need to know about Matthew. Matthew was an Israelite who had turned his back on, the, on, the, on his own people. And he had kind of gone to the dark side. And it was the Roman Empire. And he became a tax collector. That was like unheard of for you to turn your back on your own people as an Israelite, as a child of God, as one of God's chosen, and that you would turn your back on your own people. And, and when the, the people of Israel saw him, the, the family members saw him, they were, not, they were not pleased with him at all. Matter of fact, if you begin to study the life of Matthew, Matthew wasn't even allowed to go into the temple anymore as a, as a tax collector because he was considered a traitor. And we're, we're going to study a little bit further on that he was actually one of the most, uh, uh, at that time, the tax collectors were considered some of the top of the line. Like there were sinners and then there were like tax collectors. You know what I'm talking about? You, you know somebody that you say, well, they're sinners, but then there's like sinners. Or you say they're sinners, and then there's this person. Maybe that was you at one point in time. 
Maybe some of you in this very room, people would like, yeah, there was, I'll never forget my, senior year, in, my uh, senior year in high school when I gave my heart to the Lord my junior year. And um, at the end of my junior year, my senior year, I made it a point. I want to make sure that I'm, we started a Bible study, me and a couple of guys, and we, we really wanted to reach out, and we were part of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and everything. And, and I wanted to do my top 10 most un- unsavable, the ones you've got to reach, the top 10 list. And the top five was one guy. One, two, three, four, five. His name was Mike Bursage. Mike Bursage was, in my opinion, the, the, it's like that dude was full of the devil. He was a third-degree black belt. He had hair down to here, and he sang death metal music. Now, that's not like that. Da, 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 that's like that. Da, 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 and he was, the, yeah. and he would, I mean, he would get the microphone in. I mean, he was, that's how he was. I mean, it's. And he was scary. The football players wouldn't fool with him. I mean, nobody. He was a drug head. I mean, you, you just, I mean, he was like, Mike would walk down. And, up, and he wasn't some bowed up dude, but he was bad to the bone. And I was just like, oh, I was just, oh, cool. I was like, behind him. <laughs> Anybody? And I just remember thinking, there's no way, man. He'll, and, um, and about, and about four years later, I, I was attending a church. Hey, household of Faith in Gonzales, Pastor Scott Bledsoe's there now. And, and Pastor Ed, his, his father was, and I was there, and, and there was a gentleman by the name of, of Alton Laborde, and uh, he worked at the plant, and Mike started working at that plant. And over a period of about three or four months, but Brother Alton would just begin to share the gospel with Mike. And I'll never forget sitting in church one day, and I looked over at Brother Alton after service, and kind of got started, and looked over at Alton, and I'm like, ah! <laughs> and I'm thinking, we're going to have an exorcism today, bro. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about stuff, because there was Mike Bursage. And Mike had given his heart to the Lord. He had prayed the prayer. So Brother Allen had led him to the Lord. Now, so I think about it now, and it's kind of funny. I actually ran into Mike probably about a year and a half ago. And uh, still, live, still loving God, just still serving Jesus. Goes to a little church in Walker, Louisiana. And I mean, just no hair anymore. He's, he shaved his head bald. And, and, uh, and I asked him, he said, oh, man, just loving God, just loving God. And I just thought, you never doubt God or what he can do. And don't ever look at somebody as unredeemable. Don't ever think that God can't touch somebody's life. Don't ever think that God can't save someone. Because the one that you think he can't, that's the one he's going to show you he can. You know, it's amazing how we'll go after the ones that we think God wants to use. But understand that Jesus didn't go after the ones everybody else wanted. He went after the ones nobody else wanted. And that's who he changed. And here we show, we see it right here. So here's Matthew, the tax collector. People didn't like him. The people, the only people that he liked, that liked him, were the other tax collectors in the Roman Empire because he was making money for them. Now, here's the thing that, that Matthew would do and that the Roman Empire would do. The Romans, would, they would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're the tax collector. You, we need X amount of dollars from these people. Now, this is what we require. But you charge them whatever you want to. And whatever you get above what we require, that's yours. Well, Matthew was a pretty good tax collector, so that ought to tell you something. That ought to tell you that he, he was one of those individuals that he realized, man, I'm going to take this to the full extent. And, and he was actually working his way up the ranks. He had his own table, and he's sitting there, and he's, he's collecting all these taxes. And, and I can imagine, can you imagine sitting somewhere? I, if you're, is anybody here that you're ta- you work for the tax? How many of you love tax collectors? Okay, all right. Oh, these are all saved. That's right. I forgot. <laughs> You're in church. But you can understand. I mean, I, I've never walked up into the, you know, to a postal waiting net or the people to do my taxes and go, Whoa, I'm excited about this this year. It's never happened. Mm-mm, no. I, I'm, so can you imagine as Matthew is sitting at this table and I imagine as people are walking up, they're not walking up to him and going, hey, Matthew, it's so good to see you today. You're looking mighty fine today. Here's all my money. See you later. Never see, he's never done that. No, people weren't doing that. So you can imagine the looks that he was getting. I mean, and, and they're from people that are his family, people that are from his, his, his body, his, you know, the children of Israel that are coming up and they're putting this money before him and they're looking at him and they're just, they're, oh, and I imagine he's kind of got used to it. He's probably gotten numb to it. He's probably gotten cold to it because the only thing on his heart and on his mind, so everybody thinks, is just he's, just, he's here to rip us off. He's just here to make money. But you've got to understand, and I've often wondered, you know, what was it about Matt? Did, Matt, did Matthew at some point in time in his life think, start thinking, was it when he was about eight or nine years old, did this thing hit him about, wow, I'm good with numbers. 
Man, I can really work some numbers. Man, I really, I really got a knack for making money. I really want to be wealthy. What was it in his house? What happened in his house that, you know, I got to believe that his mom and dad, being Israelites, they knew the things of God. They spoke the things of God over his life. And, but something happened somewhere in Matthew's heart. And the people that he was supposed to be a part of and the people that he was supposed to love and the people that it was his family, something changed. And he started thinking inwardly and thinking selfishly and thinking about money and thinking about a wealthy living and thinking about a fine house and a nice car and the best shoes. And and that kind of is what started controlling him. See, here's the reality is that we're all susceptible to it if we're not careful. We're all susceptible to getting our thoughts out of whack, so to speak. If we're not careful, we're all susceptible to allowing something to come into our heart that will not line up with what God has in store for us. I don't believe it was God's plan for him to ever be a tax collector. But it doesn't mean that even though he took a detour, God can't put him back on the right road. It doesn't matter how many detours you take in your life. God's goal is that he wants to put you on the right path. God's purpose is that he wants to get you back on the right track. And so Matthew finds himself here, and it says he's sitting at this table, and it says Jesus is looking at him, and here's what Jesus says. First thing he says, follow me. And then he says, and be my disciple. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. I want us to think about this for just a second. Matthew is sitting at his table. He's got all these people coming. Money, money, money. He's getting the looks. He's probably his, maybe he's just got his head down because he's tired of seeing all the faces and he's tired of seeing all the dirty looks and he's tired of seeing all of the, you know, maybe hearing all the stuff and he's trying to drown it out and all these folks, I'm focusing on my money. I'm getting rich. I'm getting, and things kind of just maybe went quiet for a second. You ever had that feeling that somebody's watching you? Somebody's looking at you? Somebody's staring at you? And, and, and maybe he sees the feet. Maybe he sees the sandals and the, the garment of someone, and he looks up. And those eyes look different than the other eyes that were looking across from him. The demeanor on this man's face was different than the demeanor on the face of every individual that he had encountered that day. The softness in the voice and the tone of this man's voice was different than all of the other tones and voices that were coming to him. That Something was different about this encounter than all of the other encounters that he had. When people come in contact with you, and they do come in contact with you on a daily basis, is the tone in your voice different than all the other voices they hear? The look in your eyes, is it a look of judgment and condemnation or is it a look of compassion? Because here's the reality. It doesn't matter if you're having a bad day. People are lost and they need Christ. And if we don't get over our bad day, there's going to be somebody out there that's looking for that look of compassion, that look of grace, that look of mercy, and not the look of judgment and guilt and condemnation and trying to figure out what have you done to cause yourself to be in the position that you're at right there at that moment. They need someone to look beyond all of that and say, you know what, the world sees a throwaway, the world sees a traitor, the world sees somebody that's just after money, but I see somebody with a purpose. I see somebody that God has got a special plan for their life. Do we look at them like that? We're talking about a good God. But does he look good through us to other people? We talk about serving the least of these. We sang about that this morning. We made this proclamation to God that we want to serve the least. We want to go after the poor. We want to go after the ones that are less fortunate. Is it the number one thing on our heart? Is it truly what we're about? Or is it just part of a song that we sing during worship on a Sunday morning? Because the reality is, we're not changing lives in this building. 
We change lives when we leave this building and we go out into that lost world. Matthew is there and he looks up and Jesus just says, follow me. Be my disciple. And it says that Matthew got up at that moment and followed him. Think about this for a second. Pretend you're Matthew. Would you have had the same response? Well, of course it was Jesus, but you didn't know him at that time. You, you, don't know, you wouldn't have known him like you know him now. Wasn't any books written on him. Wasn't really, he was just up and coming. His fame and fortune and his notoriety wasn't really there at the moment. This is the beginning of stages of his ministry. Would you have done the same thing? This is how most of us would have responded. Follow me. Be my disciple. Follow you? Okay, can I, I, got, a, I got a couple of questions real quick. Where exactly are we going? <laughs> um, how long are we going to be gone for? Um, do I need to pack a bag? Because I need to run back to my house, and, and it's going to be a long trip. I didn't wear the right shoes today. My hiking boots are at the house. Do, wh what is it exactly we're going to be doing when I follow you? What, what, is, what is going to be my responsibility? What is it exactly that I'm going to be doing? As you can tell, I'm not the outdoorsy person, Lord. I'm not the one that's kind of really going. As you can tell, I sit behind the desk, so I kind of got a little bit more around the midsection here. I might not be able to walk near as fast as the other guys. Those guys that are following you, it looks like they work real hard with their hands because Peter and the other disciples that he had called, Andrew, the fishermen and everything, they, they had been working and they were following Jesus in his place and some of the disciples and Matthew's like, look, I, I haven't really been exercising a whole lot. I've kind of been laid up at the house. I just come here, sit at this table, and I like to eat, and, you know, and it's Jerusalem, it's Israel, it's, and I like, they got some pretty good food, and, and, and so well, exactly what is it? So here's the other thing I need to know is that if I'm going to leave this spot right here, how much money will I be making if I follow you? Um, do you have a 401k? Because, uh, you know, Rome's got me set up pretty good, and, and what exactly is it about the future, and, 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 and how much is it actually going to cost me? And, and, and by the way, will I be able to come back and visit? And, and listen, if you let me stay a little bit longer, I can make, I've got a little bit more money. The people that normally give me a lot, they haven't really made it here yet. They're going to be here a little bit later. So if you can hold off a few minutes, I can have a little bit more money. I'll leave what goes to Rome, but the rest will be for us. I can even treat you guys to lunch, man. I can take care of us financially. You know, Lord, this is what I've, I feel gifted to do this. How about I not go? How about I just write a check to your ministry? Would that be okay? Is it, is it okay if I just send a check this time? Can I just go ahead and, and, and pay for that? I mean, you know, I mean, how much is it really going to cost me? How long will we be doing this? Can you tell me the outcome? Isn't that what we do? We encounter somebody. And the Lord in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit says, I want, you to go, I want you to go reach out to that person. I don't know that person. I don't, I don't know anything about them. What am I going to say? I'm not a real good communicator. I'm not called to be a preacher. That's Pastor Marvin's responsibility. I, I just support him, and I pray for him. And How about I just pray for that person, Lord? I don't really know if I can go over and say anything to him. Can I just pray for him from afar? Come on. Come on. I, I, isn't, that how, I, isn't that how we, we respond a lot of times? You know, the scripture says obedience is better than sacrifice. You know why that is? I started thinking about that and started studying a little bit about what is it about? Why is it that God requires obedience over sacrifice? It's not that he doesn't want to give. You know, it's not that he doesn't want to receive our apology or receive our sacrifice. He said, I prefer obedience over sacrifice. Here's why. When you're obedient... It is a confirmation that you're saying to him, you're Lord of my life. I don't control what I do. I don't control where I go, and I don't control it. I, I belong to you, and I'm surrendered to you, and you're my Lord. And if you look that word up, Lord, in the Greek, that word means boss. Now, I don't know about you, but if I don't do what my boss tells me to do, I don't stay employed very long. Go to your job tomorrow and have your boss come up to you and tell you, hey, I need you to do this, and you look at him and say, I'm sorry, I can't do it. But I did say I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you don't have a job. But I did say I'm sorry. 
obedience. Because when we're obedient, not only does it bless us to be obedient, it also blesses the people or the situation that God is asking us to go and be a part of. If, if God says, go do something to this individual, and I go and I pray for that pastor, I, I lift him, I give him a word of encouragement, I've been obedient to what God has spoken, they, they may not understand it at the moment. They may not even receive it at the moment. But at some point in time, they're going to walk away, and those words are going to sink in. Why? Because I was obedient. I know I heard from God to go speak. And those words are going to resonate with that individual. And they're going to walk off, and all of a sudden, later on, it's going to start resonating in their brain. It's going to start triggering something in their mind. I went to Walmart during the Christmas holidays on College Drive, and my wife and I were just walking around, and we were going, and she ended up on one side of Walmart. I ended up on the other side of Walmart, and she called and said, I'm over here. So I started heading over there to go find her. And and as I'm walking, I'm walking by the cloth department, the, 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 the sewing department. There was an African-American lady sitting there, and, and she looked very tired and looked very weary. And, and as I'm just walking by, I felt the Holy Spirit say, go over there and tell her I love her. Okay. Walked over to her. I said, ma'am, how are you doing today? She just looked up at me, and she said, she said well, we've had, I've had better days. I said, well, you know what? I was walking by here just a second ago. And I said, the Lord told me to come by and tell you that he loves you. And he loves everything about you. And he's got a perfect plan for your life. Man, you could have swore I just gave that woman the lottery, the winning lottery ticket. Praise God. You're right. He does. (laughs) Thank you, brother. It it took all of about 10 seconds. I walked away with my chest bowed up a little bit more. Of course, I look like a little banny rooster with my chest out, you know. (laughs) I, I just, and I, I, just, it just, I just thought, God, thank you for letting me do that. Thank you for that opportunity. See, that's what obedience does. You know what sacrifice does? Sacrifice is us going and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Why do we sacrifice? We sacrifice because of sin. We sacrifice because of disobedience. We sacrifice because of wrongdoing. So when God tells us to do something, we go to him, and we can be genuine in our heart. It can be real, and we say, Lord, I messed up. I should have gone and taken advantage of that opportunity, and I didn't do it, Lord. I repent before you right now. Well, guess what? He is faithful and just to forgive us. But guess what? The person that he wanted us to go speak to, they didn't get the blessing. We got the blessing of being forgiven. So when you think about obedience is better than sacrifice, the reason he wants obedience is because obedience, everybody wins. God was lifted up. That lady was lifted up. I was lifted oh, man, I, we all walked away. My, my God was saying, whoo, well done, thou good and faithful son. And that lady was over there going, thank you, Lord, for just letting me know, reminding me it's not about this job. It, you're with me no matter what, even in the hard times. And I was able to walk away and say, God, give me another one. Where's another one at? Yeah. Right, right, good. So, so what does Matthew do? He says, he says, so Matthew got up and followed him. Now, now here's another thing you need to understand about this. <laughs> Peter, Jesus already had several disciples following him. Remember, earlier in the, tra- earlier in the story, or, or in the Bible, he goes to the side of the sea where, you know, Peter and Andrew and his brothers, they're, they're cleaning the fish nets, and Jesus just walks up to him and says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And he says they drop their nets and begin to follow him, okay? So Jesus is walking, and Peter and them are walking behind them. He, they see this exchange going on with Matthew. Peter, because again, Peter's an Israelite. Peter knows Matthew. Peter's family knows Matthew. Everybody knows Matthew. He's got a rep. Are you hearing me? Well, because of that rep, Peter didn't come up to Jesus. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus, Jesus, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. here. Got to talk to you, me and the fellas. We know you're kind of new to this whole building a team thing. We were at a John Maxwell conference, leadership conference. He says, those are not the guys you want right there. They're going to they're give you a bad reputation. So listen, we, we just need, to, we need you to understand our kind don't really gel with his kind. We, we, we kind of like the good Israelites. He ain't the good one. So we, we took a vote. 
we, we, uh, we feel like you might need to choose somebody else that him going back to doing what he was doing. <laughs> they didn't do that. But, but you know, that's funny is that that's what happens sometimes in churches. <laughs> Pastor makes a call. We need volunteers. We need ministry leaders. We need somebody. And so all of a sudden, there you've been, man. You've rolled up your sleeves, and you've been working diligently, and somebody new comes in, and now they want to get involved. And, but you know them, and y'all have got a history. And, or maybe y'all, your, your, you know, your personalities kind of clash or whatever. And so you go to the pastor and say, uh, Pastor, I really don't know that I can work with that individual right there. Um, I, if you could kind of steer them in another ministry path or you know, volunteer somewhere else, like maybe the parking lot or you know, let them clean bathrooms or something. I just, and, and it's like, and, you know, and I'll start thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe the reason God pulled them in and put them in that situation is because there are some rough edges on your life that need to be knocked off or sanded off and that is the right person for the job to come in. But you know what happens is a lot of times we come up there and we say, well, I don't really like, we don't really, we don't really click. And, and you know, and, and, and if, if, you, if this is how you want it done, I'm going to have to go to another church because I don't know if I can do it here. And then what happens is you go to another church and you bring that same spirit over there. At some point in time, we've got to say, you know what? We're all part of the body of Christ. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe the issue isn't with them, the issue is with you. I mean, you think about some of the people Jesus had working for him. You would have never chosen that team. There's no leader in leadership today of corporate America that would have chosen the team he chose. They were the rejects from the world. But those are the ones that God turned the world right side up with. Look what happens. Y'all get anything from this today? Verse 10. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors. Look at this. And other disreputable sinners. <laughs> Look at the person next to you say, you know you were disreputable at one time. <laughs> Some of you may still be a little disreputable. Come on. <laughs> disreputable. I started thinking, man, <laughs> you know, there are tax collectors and then there's disreputable people. Where do you fit in at? Where, where, where is it? And so, so they're, they're here and, and, and they're hanging. Peter, I mean, Matthew was so excited about this new adventure he was about to be on. And he told Jesus, he said, man, I got a bunch of guys. They need to know you. They, they need to see you. They need to hear you. That compassion you got, I want them to know about it. What was it about? Remember with the woman at the well whenever, whenever Jesus encountered her? She didn't kind of go on the down low. What did she? She ran into town. Come here. Come meet the guy that told me all about my life. People, everybody knew about her life. Everybody knew who she was. Five husbands. I mean, come on. And the one she was living with at that moment wasn't even hers, but everybody knew her. Why? You know what it was? It's because where everybody else knew her and was talking bad about her, she met one that was ready to forgive her. Yeah. She, she met the one that didn't look at her and judge her like everybody else did. You know, it's amazing. People that don't know Christ, when we go to them in the right spirit, in the right heart, in the right attitude, they want to be around us. Why? Because we exude the grace and the mercy and the love and the compassion of our Savior. And, and where the world, had, you don't think for one minute that the enemy hasn't been beating the snot out of them in their heads and in their minds with thoughts of, uh, of unworthiness and, uh, and every bad thing that there is? Jesus comes along and he says, listen, I know what the world says about you, but I'm not of the world. I've got a plan for your life. Good. And it doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter how many bad roads you've gone down. I've got a purpose and a plan for you. Matthew's like, Lord, I, I, I want y'all to come to my house because I got some other guys, they need to hear the same thing because they feel the same way that I do. We, we, we kind of have this accountability group. Well, it's not really an accountability group other than that we kind of hold each other accountable to make more money. But we, we kind of meet together and talk about things, and sometimes it gets real, real, and we kind of share some things that are, that are burdening us, that are on our heart, and some th ways that we feel. And I know them, and, and, and I want you to meet them too. So Jesus goes to that house, and he's there. And look what happens. It says, the other disreputable sinners. 
But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Wow. This is this is the representation of the church saying this about a lost people. The religious leaders of that day, that's all the people knew as the church. That's all they knew as the ones that were supposed to be the representatives of God. The leaders. This isn't just church members. This is church leadership. And they're referring to God's people as scum? You realize that the reason the majority of the lost world does not want to go to church today is because of the representation that they've seen. Why in the world do people want to come to church when they see the way the church treats others? Even more so the way the church treats each other. One of my responsibilities in growing up was I had to take care of the chickens. It was my, my responsibility. I had to feed them, had to gather the eggs, and had to do all that kind of stuff. And Something I learned after a while of taking care of the chickens was this. If you ever had a chicken that had a sore on it, you better get that chicken out of the chicken coop real fast. Because if you don't get that chicken out of the chicken coop, then what happens is the other chickens come along and they start pecking at the sore on that other chicken. And they will peck at that sore and peck at that sore and peck at that sore until eventually they will have killed that chicken. Wow. The church sometimes is a chicken coop. And rather be in a place for us to restore individuals to the rightness of God, we ostracize them. We judge them. We pick them apart. We tell them they're unfit. We tell them God can't use them anymore. And the world sees us. And the world watches us. And those individuals that were once in church, they've got family members that are watching how you treat, how we treat that person. And don't think for one minute that they're not going to go back. And maybe they were just on the cusp of starting to come. Maybe they were just at that point where they were starting, they were thinking about attending church because their relative had been talking about it for so long. But then all of a sudden, their relative made a mistake, had a moral failure, was, was caught at a place they shouldn't have been caught at. And the church didn't respond with the grace and the mercy of God. They responded with judgment and self-righteousness. And now we didn't just lose a member, we lost the entire family. When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Why, why are you here? Why are you here as a church? I, I, read, a, I read a book one time. And the guy that, that wrote the book said, a lot of times in churches, you drive up to it and the grounds are pristine. Grass is manicured. Paint is perfect. People are dressed perfectly. Everything is clean. Everything looks good. You walk in, and I mean, everything is perfect. And he says, those are the ones that scare me. He says, I want to go up to a church where there's cigarette buds around the outside. And, and, and people aren't dressed in the best clothes they got. Or maybe they're dressed in their best clothes, but it doesn't match anybody else's best clothes. He said, that's the church you know that are reaching the ones that need Christ. And it's not a social club. It's not a society for the elite. 
but it's a hospital for the hurting. That's what God's called us to. He's called us to go into all the world. You know what? I, you know what? I, I tell our people what we do on a Sunday morning is kind of like uh, a, a pep rally. We we tr- as the as the pastors we try to pep the people up to go out into the world and do the things that God's called them to do. We have been given a commission by God to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I heard a guy say one time, he says, you need to preach the gospel every time you have an opportunity. And when necessary, use words. Our lives should be a a walking message of the gospel. The way we treat others, the the way we help other people out. And Jesus is saying right here, he says, listen, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I came for the the woman at the well that's been in every kind of uh, ungodly relationship there is. I came for the one that would be later brought before my feet and the people are wanting to stone her because she was caught in the act of adultery. I came for the ones that are blind on the road of the side and everybody else has kicked them to the and tell them to shut up and keep their mouth quiet because Jesus doesn't. I came for the children where everybody else thinks it's just an adult thing and he says, no, unless you have the unless you have the heart of a child, you can't even inherit the kingdom of God. I came for all of those, the ones that the religious rejected. Rejected, the ones the religious don't have anything to do with, the ones the religious don't even want to go to their house and associate with, those are the ones I came for. Think about this for a second. The religious people are saying, he says, um, why does he associate with such, such scum? And Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Can you imagine if, if, if Matthew is sitting there and having conversation with some of his other sinner friends and, and he hears this word, wait a minute, Jesus, hold on. You saying we sick? What's up with that? Matthew, you know you sick. Now, just going back to hanging out with your, your boys. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right, I am. That's, it's all good, it's all good. <laughs> but, but look what happens. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Now, understand what Jesus is saying. Look what he says again. Go and understand the meaning of this scripture. He's talking to the religious scholars of that day. He's talking to the ones that are the teachers of the religious law. And he's saying, not he's saying, he's hanging out with sinners, that's bad enough. He's hanging out with scum, that's bad enough. Now he's going to tell them to go learn what the scripture says? You, You know what that tells me? Is that we can have every bit of this right here, right there. But it never get right here. I, 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 I heard a guy say one time, and I thought it was really interesting. He said, there'll be so many people that will miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the distance between your brain and your heart. 18 inches. See, it's not enough to quote the Scripture. We've got to live the Scripture. We, we can quote Scripture all day long, but if we don't live it, it doesn't mean anything. God's going to honor His Word. No doubt about that. That's why, if you notice, if you notice there were a couple of, uh, a time whenever uh, there were some people going around preaching the gospel, they were doing it for profit. And the people were coming to Paul, and they're like, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And Paul says, hey, leave them alone. If they're of God, it'll last. If it's not of God, they won't last. Either way, God's being lifted up. But we need to make sure that our hearts are right. We need to make sure we're doing the things that God's called us to do. Going where God's called us to go. And doing it with the right motives and the right heart. Not for selfish gain. Not because well, we're going to do that outreach. Was Pastor Marvin going to be there? Well, then I'm going to go. If Pastor Marvin's not going to be there. I'm not going to go. I've seen that in churches. People show up when pastor's there, but they don't want to do anything when pastor's not there because they want to be noticed by pastor. Pastor has nothing to do with your eternity. You, do you realize 
our responsibility as pastors of a church are to equip you to do the work? Yes. Pastor, I need you to do this. Pastor, I need you to do this. I, I've, got a, I've got a rule now that when people come to me with a ministry idea, I tell them, hey, that sounds like a great idea. And since the Lord seems to have given it to you, I think you need to be in charge of it. You know, I've got a lot less oper ministry opportunities coming in my pathway now. I, God never called me to juggle that ball. Hold on, throw that other one on. Okay, okay, here we go again. God called me to pastor, called me to shepherd. He called you to do the work. Our responsibility is to make sure that the sheep are healthy so that the sheep can reproduce. So when we talk about serving, we talk about going out and reaching the world, that's your responsibility. That's what God's called you to do. Here's the reality. You encounter people every single day, Pastor Marvel will never know. I, I used to have people say, man, I'm about to tell you, I've been, I've been trying to reach my friend. I told him, if you could just come to church, if you could just come to church, if you could just come here, if you hear my pastor preach it, if you could come get in our worship. And I look at him and say, is your life that bad that they can't find Christ through what you're doing? Well, why, if, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, they should encounter God even before they ever come through the doors of a church. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Where do you stand today? Where are you at? Two things I want to ask you this morning. You know, normally about this time, you'd say, hey, man, everybody bow your head and close your eyes. But you know what I've realized through the years? If you can't make decisions in a church around godly people to serve God or not serve God, you'll never do it outside the doors of a church. So I don't, I don't I want you to bow your head and close your eyes, but I will ask you two questions today. Here's the first question. Matthew came to a realization that he needed God in his life. It wasn't a money issue, he had that. It wasn't a job issue, he had that. It wasn't a social status, he had that but he didn't have a right heart with God. If you're here today, and I don't know where you are, maybe you got it all going on, but deep down inside, when you're by yourself and you're home alone and you're away from everybody else, there's something that's going on on the inside that you realize, man, there's some things that are not right. And I don't have that relationship with Christ that I need to. I've never got up and started following him and have never committed to being a disciple of his. But this morning, man, Pastor Timmy, you said some things that have really spoken to my heart. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm ready to make a decision for Christ. I'm ready to really turn my life over to Christ and truly follow him and truly be a disciple of Christ. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. So you got me this morning. Come on, all of us, just be honest. Where you at? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm all over this place. Thank you. You're here today. And you do have a relationship with Christ. But God has been speaking to you about doing something. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's witnessing to a person at your job. Maybe it's doing an outreach in your neighborhood. Maybe it is. I, I don't know what it is. But God has been quickening your spirit and you've been sitting there, and you've been in a debate with God. First of all, let me tell you something. You're not going to win that debate. Just forget it. Quit trying. You're wasting time. You're in this debate. And I really feel like this morning, you're at a place that you say, you know what? The debate is over. I'm just going to give in to it. And I'm going to surrender to what God's calling me to do. Maybe it's to go to the mission field. Maybe it's to surrender to go into the ministry full time. I don't know. But as I was sharing this morning, you can identify with where Matthew was about, I need to just give it all. I need to be, a, I just need to, everything he, I know what he's called me. Some of you in this room right now, you already know what I'm talking about. God's already been speaking something in your life that he's called you to do. And you've been in negotiations. 
it's time to get away from the negotiating table and just continue to just follow him. Say, that's it, I'm following you. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. Come on, all over this place. Thank you, thank you. If you raised your hand this morning, I want you to stand to your feet right now.